morning, our call to worship, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. All right, let's sing together. Uh, it's hymn number two, if you'd like it in your book, and let's stand as we sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. <clears throat> Come, Christians, join to sing, Alleluia, Amen. Loud praise to Christ our King, Alleluia, Amen. Let all with heart and voice before His throne rejoice, Praise is His gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Come, lift your hearts on high. Alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend. again. Alleluia. Amen. Life shall not end the strain. Alleluia. Amen. On heaven's blissful shore, His goodness will adore. Singing forevermore. Alleluia. seated. Our scripture reading this morning uh, is a little bit lengthy, but follow if you would as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. Again, 1 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 23. Paul writes, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this, meat is, sacrificed, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that which I, for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men and all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. The Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. One of my favorite hymns as we continue, number 483, Like a River Glorious. <clears throat> like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth, fuller every day. Perfect yet it groweth, deeper all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah, arts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand, never foe can follow, never 
traitor stand. Not a surge of worry, not a shade of care, not a blast of hurry touched a spirit there. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully him fully all for us to do they who trust him wholly find him wholly true stayed upon Jehovah hearts are fully blessed finding as he promised perfect peace and I can't wait to hear Amelia singing as she grows. This is fun. Gentlemen, you're on for special music. You didn't know it. That's what makes it impromptu. Number 413, Faith is the Victory. And fellows, if you'd come and join me. are dismissed to junior church at this time.
if you can't pass for under eight years old, would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 with me? So I'm flying solo today as uh, Kim is in the process of helping Abby drive down to her new adventure, uh, living with Eric and Kristen Smith and family in Myrtle Beach. Uh, I love the Smiths. At least I used to. Um, I called him. I says, what kind of nerve is this? A man with five children, all five of them living in his town, steals my only remaining child at home and my only daughter. I thought we were friends, Eric. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, Abby fits right in with that crew, and uh, it gives her a safe place to spread her wings a little bit, get a job, and see what the Lord does. And uh, I wish it wasn't six or seven states away, but it is. And uh, it's so much easier to send them down the eastern seaboard, seaboard on a Sunday uh, than it is any other day. So it was a weekend trip. And um, anyway, it's just me and Ella, our black lab, and uh, we're making out all right. I think she knows. She's curled up where Abby's pillow goes. I'm pretty sure she knows. I don't think she has any clue how long, but she knows it will be a bit. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're holding up. We're getting there. And no, I didn't buy a new car. Although for what I'm paying in repairs, I probably could. That's just a loaner out there. And uh, I'm putting all the miles on that loaner I can. Isn't that terrible? Uh, but true. Anyway, uh, we have been studying in 1 Corinthians. Paul is writing back to a church he started some time before. Uh, he had spent quite a little bit of time with them. Uh, Corinth is a very worldly place. Uh, Corinth is at the center of an isthmus. Uh, an isthmus being an narrow strip of land that connects two larger pieces of land. It connects the mainland of Greece and then Macedonia with the Peloponnesus. Peloponnesus, that would be an island except for that little isthmus. And uh, between the Aegean and the Adriatic Sea, there's now a canal there. And so it, it saves them a lot of travel time and danger going through the canal. In this day, in Paul's day, uh, they would unload ships on one side and carry things over by slave and animal power to the other side. Small ships were actually rolled across. It was only a mile and a half, two miles at its narrowest. Uh, what it was, what that made it was a very affluent city. It had money. It made it a very wicked city, both because there is a temple there uh, where the worship was immorality itself. Uh, this temple and, and the idols that were worshipped there and the meat that's being talked about. A lot of people, a, lo a lot of sailors a long way from home. A lot of people a long way from home. Uh, a lot of money changing hands, there was a lot of immorality there, just tons of it. And so Paul is writing to people who've gotten saved, and they've gotten saved out of a terrible world, out of, out of a very immoral culture, and he's challenging them to live differently than their peer group, to live differently than their neighbors. And uh, he's calling right out to them. We're studying judges in our Sunday evenings, and what we're seeing is that the nation of Israel... They've seen God do amazing things, but generation to generation, they keep falling in with their neighbors and doing what their neighbors do. And in their case, that's worshiping pagan gods, gods that were so evil that they required, so-called, the, the sacrifice of children that were killed in the worship of Molech. I won't go into any more detail than that, but that's just how grievous it was. And so false teaching, immorality, idolatry, true idol worship uh, was prominent. It was all over the place. And for them to go to a, to like a, you ever go to a, a community meal, uh, you know, somebody in the church or in, in the area hosts a supper. Uh, a lot of towns I've lived in, the local volunteer fire department raises money by hosting a supper and uh, everybody does their functions at the fire hall. I've lived in towns where they had to pull the trucks out to set the tables up and have dinner and that's what people do. My first church in a small town in western New York, it was on our budget that we gave money to the local fire department. I was really surprised by that and I asked the deacons about it and they said, Pastor, how, does that, how do they raise money? Have you noticed? I says, yeah, I've noticed two things. I said, they're always having barbecue chicken dinners that are always on Wednesday night while I'm at prayer meeting and they said, exactly. And, I, and they said, what else do they do? I said, they raffle guns. And me, I, you know, with my luck, I'd win, and everybody would say, oh, the preacher's gambling. So I, I never put into the raffles, and I never got to go to one of those chicken dinners. I had to smell them. One, it seemed like all summer long, at least one Wednesday night a month, I had to smell them on my way to church. 
we were glad to help them, but we just couldn't fit in because of schedule, really. Um, but um, community is important. I'm not saying it isn't. It's a wonderful thing, community. Uh, and the problem that was in Corinth was community dinners were at the temple. You see, they would offer this meat. They would set this meat out as a sacrifice to their gods, small g, and they never ate any of it. Can you imagine? They never had a bite. And so there was always plenty of leftovers. And so these leftovers got taken to the meals, the community meals at the temple, because for most people, their worship and their community living, their civic duty or whatever, were intertwined in those days. Uh, but also, this meat would go back to the market, and sometimes you could buy it at a discount. If you know my wife, you know that she is a discount shopper. She comes by it honestly. I remember one time I was working for her brother-in-law and her sister, uh, fixing a house, and the Shatneys came down, mom and dad came down to visit, and we worked and worked and worked, and finally, long about six o'clock, they let us stop working long enough to eat spaghetti. It was always spaghetti at the Kinney's house. And um, after that spaghetti, we all wanted ice cream, and so the fellows went back to work, the ladies went shopping for ice cream, they came back a half hour, 45 minutes later, and they had no ice cream. Why? It wasn't on sale at any of the three supermarkets in town. They got another, you know, couple hours of work out of me with the promise of ice cream, and they didn't pay up at all. But that's how my wife is wired. And, and a sale, and right now, beef prices are nuts, and so if you find beef on sale, if you're like me, you jump at it, you know, a good deal. Unless it's, you know, really gross looking, you jump at it. Well, the on-sale meat was often labeled idle meat. If it was labeled idle meat, Paul's going to tell them, let it go if it's labeled. If you know what it is, don't eat it. If you go to the temple, you know what that is, don't go there, don't eat that. And then he tells them what to do if they're in a private person's home and so forth. There's a, simil a similarity here between 1 Corinthians 8 and uh, our passage, the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And really, there, there, it's not deja vu, or as my dad would say, deja vu all over again. Uh, it's really not that. What's really happening is we're looking at it from two different angles. Uh, in chapter 8, it started from the thought of not offending an immature brother. So he says, think about the person who is newly saved, is a baby in Christ. There might be a liberty that you think you can exercise that might cause that brother to fall into sin. I gave you kind of a funny illustration one of my college professors had, and I remembered his roommate his freshman year was an older guy, who'd never married, he got saved, he came to Bible college, and he had been, he was a jazz musician, I guess a very good one, and I don't know if it was Atlantic City or something like that, but he played in the clubs, and he was very good at what he did, and after he would play a set, people would buy him a drink. He ended up being a terrible drop-down drunk who couldn't function, and that's what God saved him out of, and he had this issue. Whenever he heard saxophone music, he salivated for alcohol. He wanted a drink when he heard the saxophone. Is there anything innately evil in a saxophone? Only when a kid is learning it for the first time. But no, there's nothing evil in a saxophone. There's nothing wrong with that. But my professor, when he was a, a college student, he didn't take his Kenny G records back to school. He left them at home and never had them in front of the fellow. Why? Because it, may, it helped take him to sin, and he didn't want to have any part with taking a brother to sin. That's what chapter 8's about. Chapter 8 is don't eat the meat because you don't want to cause a brother to, to stumble. If you cause someone else to go against their conscience, you're sinning with them. That's the premise of chapter 8. Here in chapter 10, Paul speaks of it in regard to the use and not abuse of personal liberties under the greater picture of denying one's personal rights in order to help others. Paul is, has given us an example himself. He says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To the Gentiles, as a Gentile, that I might win the Gentiles. He's not pretending to be somebody he's not. He actually kind of grew up in a unique circumstance as a Roman citizen on one hand and as a Jewish man raised Jewish on the other. What he's saying is, if I have to check my freedom at the door to reach people for Christ, I'm going to do that. If I have to eat kosher, then that's what I'm going to do. If I have to not work from Friday evening to Saturday evening because I'm going to offend all my Jewish friends and not be able to share the gospel with them, then that's what I'm going to do. I've talked to you often about my friend Danny Woods that uh, ministers in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil to a Jewish population. He eats kosher. 
He doesn't eat kosher because he thinks he has to. He eats kosher so he doesn't offend the Jews. He's trying to reach for Christ. Their church does not have pew Bibles because his pew Bibles would include the New Testament. And a practicing Jew is forbidden to physically touch a New Testament because they don't believe in it. So they don't have pew Bibles. They always have their scripture on the wall. I know this because our church helped them, my, the church that was supporting them helped them buy their first projector so they could put their scripture on the wall and there was nothing there, you know. Uh, their, their group of people, they were sticklers for the don't touch, but they didn't see any problem at all with reading it off the wall and so that's what they did. The bottom line of all of it is, was back in 1 Corinthians 8.13, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again so that I'll not cause my brother to stumble. Uh, today, our purpose is this. Freedom must be regulated by responsibility. I have a wonderful freedom in Christ. I am free from the Old Testament law. I'm free from legalism. I'm free from sin. I'm not free to li live as a hedonist and just please self. I'm free to serve. Galatians is about that. I'm free to serve the Lord and to love other people. I have a wonderful freedom. How do I use my freedom? Uh, it's just Ella and I at home. Ella's a five-year-old black lab who still has a lot of puppy in her. Uh, we, we have a redneck fence in our backyard and where we, we, we put up pallets uh, with you know fence stakes in between them to hold them up. And that just gives her a place that she can run and roam and take care of those things that dogs have to take care of. But when we go to Maine and we go to Kim's parents or to my dad's and we're out in the country, she has learned not to run off and so she has a freedom. So up there, I can open the door and say, go ahead, hon. And she goes out, and, and she'll run, and she'll, she'll sniff, you know, and up there, there's critters in the woods, and oh my goodness, if she comes across a possum, life gets exciting. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, she has that freedom, but if she ever decided that she wanted to run off, that freedom would have to be scaled back radically, wouldn't it? So as long as she uses that freedom for a good purpose, it's terrible. We're talking about dogs and people. Well, here we have us. How do we use our freedom? Do we use it for good things or do we use it for bad things? Um, do we use it for the cause of Christ or does it hurt the cause of Christ? We have to be very careful of it. Let's have a word of prayer and dig in. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Please focus our attention on it this morning. Help us to see what it has for us. Uh, we realize, Lord, it, it's, it's not a direct application. We don't really have to deal with idle meat. Uh, but Lord, the principle is very, very applicable to today. And help us, Lord, to take it to heart, to understand it, and to live by it. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Uh, Paul says elsewhere, all things are lawful, but I won't be brought under the power of any. In those three statements, you, you have a pretty good framework to deal with. All things are lawful, but not all are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all build myself or other people up. And all things are lawful, but I don't want to be mastered and made a slave by anything that I'm putting in myself or doing myself, etc. Uh, here, we've got to be reminded that sin is sin. And all sin is an affront to God. You and I tend to put sins in a hierarchy, don't we? I've had students say to me, but Mr. Heyman, that's not a sin sin, you know. Uh, I love the, the one that cheated on her midterm, and she, she defended it by saying it wasn't a sin sin. It was only a sort of sin. And I said, what's a sin sin? She said, oh, Ten Commandments. I said, doesn't one of those say not to steal? And when you stole that answer off the other guy's paper, wasn't that stealing? And she didn't see it that way, but um, that's only because she did, wasn't looking. Um, Paul's not talking about freedom to do anything. We, we still, sin is still sin. Morality is still morality. His point is that in Christ, especially for his audience, in Christ, as opposed to Old Testament Judaism, we have a tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, I've shared it several times, I think mostly in the men's class. When I started teaching at Evangel Baptist in Dale City, Virginia, the, the principal had me into his office, and he started using his hands, and he, he says, Mr. Heyman, I want you to know you're not tethered. You're not locked out on a chain here. You're inside a box. It's a big box. We, we, it's a walled compound. And these, these walls, they're straight up and down. This is what we believe from God's word. And so he says, inside these walls, you have incredible freedom. You're here because we trust you. Whatever it takes to teach them, teach them. 
And some of the things I tell people that they let me do in my class, people look at me like I've got two heads. They can't believe I ever got permission to do some of the things I did in those classes. But you know what? The kids remember it probably to this day, some of the things we did. Uh, but I had wonderful freedom inside that. And he said to me, the same conversation, if you start climbing that wall, you're going to be in this office so quick your head's going to spin, and we're going to have a talk, and if you push it, you're gone. I said, understood, and I never had that talk. And I love the freedom I had within. And that's where we are in Christ. Sin is still sin, but there's a lot of room for me. I have a, I have a large walled-in compound, if you will, that I can run around in and enjoy and have perfect freedom within the bounds of God's moral law. And so he's not saying that there is no such thing as sin anymore. But the, the believer must exercise, only exercise his liberty when it's profitable to do so, when it's expedient, when it's helpful. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't do a thing, exercise a freedom really just to please ourselves, that there's a purpose in it. It's got to be, first of all, profitable. It also has to edify. He must only use his right when he and other believers will be built up by it. Um, maybe you've likely heard it said, we measure what we say with our mouth. We measure our words. The first question is, is it true? The second question is, does it build up? And the one that really catches most of what we say, is it necessary? This is a lot of what Paul's talking about here. And there's just one particular example is our speech. Is it true? Does it build up? Is it necessary? Kids today, encourage them. Man, encourage them. They're getting torn down everywhere, especially at certain age groups, especially in certain places. But encourage your kids, encourage your neighbor's kids, encourage the kids in our church. Tell them what you think of them. Tell them how much you enjoy having them here. I mean, I've been in churches where people would scowl that Amelia was singing along. We all just enjoyed it, didn't we? I mean, it's fun. She's just, it's as if she's singing, she's there looking at Auntie's book and, and crying right out. I mean, we've learned to love things like that around here. Uh, but I've been in places where people are, you know, shut that kid up. And uh, that breaks my heart. Kids need to be encouraged. They do a good thing, let them hear about it. They're going through something, let them know you're thinking about them. Let them know that you pray for them. Do you know how much that meant to me? You never think about it, but I remember as a little kid having people tell me, Nathan, I pray for you. It was amazing to me. I'll be honest, I had some people who prayed for me. Oh, did I cry when God took them home. I was like, there's nobody that, pray, that prays for me every night before they go to bed. It's a precious thing. Are we building others up by it? He should not use his liberty for his own gratification. He should not live to please self. Living to please self is hedonism. That is how the world lives. That was how the Corinthians at large outside the church lived. Hedonism. There is no moral code. Whatever feels good, I do. If it feels good to me, if it does something for me, who cares about the rest of it? Get out of my business. It's all about me, me, and me. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. It's God's pleasure we should be looking for and not our own. Is there joy in serving Jesus? We, we sing that song, that's a, that's a title. Is there truly joy in serving Jesus? Is there joy in living for Him? Sure there is. I, I find a wonderful joy when I don't have to pull against the, the collar around my neck. When I'm not a dog on a chain, I find a wonderful joy uh, a dog who's inside an electric fence that either gives him a little zap on his snout or a little buzz in his collar, uh, he has great joy when he's not up against that fence pushing his boundaries, and he can enjoy all that room he has to play with on the inside of that. Uh, that needs to be me. I need to let God work at me both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's interesting to will. God is working on me. He's working on us in him. If we're in prayer, if we're in the Word of God, if we're in the house of God, God is working on us so that our thinking, our desire, the word here is our will, becomes that which brings God His good pleasure. My thinking and God's need to be put together. Jesus promised if you ask anything according to my will, God hears you. If we ask according to God's will. 
well, you know what? A lot of our prayers aren't answered because they're not according to the will of God. And we'll be honest, there's times we don't know what to pray, don't we? We're praying for somebody who's terribly, deathly sick with cancer. And, and at what point do we stop praying for healing and start praying that God takes them home gently? Because oftentimes we get to that point, and how do we know when to make that decision? And sometimes we're praying between two good things, two good decisions, or two decisions that are of equal weight, and, and we just have to give it to God and pray, your will be done. Because very often we don't know what God's will is or what the exact nature of a thing is, but we want to try, and every time where we do know the will of God, we find that from His Word, by the way, we need to pray in God's will. But God's working on me so that my will and His will become much closer together as I live for Him and grow in Him. By the way, we're going to be to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in a number of weeks to the quote-unquote love chapter. Uh, one of the things that it teaches us about love is that love does not seek its own, but it seeks what's best for others. That's pretty awesome. Uh, that's what makes moms special. I mean, once in a blue moon you find a selfish mom, but most moms are far from selfish. They're all about taking care of their kids, no matter what it takes, no matter what, what hour of the day or night it is, no matter how big the mess is, taking care of their kids, putting others above self. That's what makes a mom a mom. That's what makes that special, I think, before the Lord and, and praiseworthy. Um, love doesn't seek its own. It seeks what's best for the other person. That's how we know what love is. One of the hallmarks of love is that love is the cent other person centric and not self centric uh, we need to use our liberty for the benefit of the christian brother philippians 2 verse 4 do not merely look out for your own personal interest but also for the interest of others um, paul says in philippians that it almost seems to contradict he says carry your own weight he tells them there's two different words for burden used that's a big part of the clue but he tells the Philippian believers, carry your own weight. Put your pack on your back and carry it. And then it says, don't look at your things, but also at the things of others. Well, the point is this. Carry, pull your own weight. Carry what you need to so that you're not an undue burden on other people. But as you do that, look for other people who are struggling. I remember so well the first time I, I led wilderness camp out in western New York at Camp La Mocha. I remember seeing this table full of kids that I was going to take into the deep woods on the Finger Lakes Trail and up and down these big mountains, and they all looked like little kids, even though this was Teen Week. And I, I cut my plan in half the minute I saw these kids. I'm like, they're not up for this. I had one boy come, and I'm telling you, he was 90 pounds soaking wet. When we weighed his pack, his pack weighed 60 pounds. So, okay, fellas, here's a bed take everything out, let's see what we can leave behind. He had gone to the local supermarket to the bulk candy section and he had bought his candy by the pound. Of that 60 pounds, fully 10 of it, 10 pounds, I kid you not, was candy. I said, buddy, if you can't hold it in one handful, you better leave it here at camp and enjoy it when we get back because you're not carrying this. Uh, I had another adult man, we had to take an EMT with us and so I had another adult man on the trip and he and I looked at each other and we just started taking all the cooking stuff that we were going to spread between the kids and it all went in our packs. And so I had to carry a little more than I wanted to and it planned on and he had to carry more than he planned on because we had these little bitty fellows who just weren't up to it. And so you look not just for your own and just traipse through the woods and let them all fall behind, but you have to look out for the other and help him share the burden that he couldn't possibly carry. And isn't that the sweetness of living in the Christian life and living in church? This church is so good about taking care of each other. I mean, people get sick, people lose a loved one, people have a surgery, people go through a thing, and oh, do we feed them. We're Baptists, it's what we do. Uh, I had the good fortune of getting COVID Thanksgiving week. If I never eat another turkey soup, don't be surprised. But how wonderful that people thought of us in the busyness of the holiday week and took care of us and left things at our door. Uh, my wife and I have had times where people needed something they couldn't go out and get. And so we went out and got it and put it on their porch. And Angela went and got stuff and put it on our porch. God's people taking care of each other. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. 
We've had people that have come to this church and have visited and been on the edges, but then they went through something and the church had an opportunity to show them Christian love and that cemented them into the family. They're like, we've been in other churches. We've never been loved like this. Down south, they call it being loved on or loving on somebody. This church knows how to love on folk and it's a sweet thing. It's a wonderful testimony. Look out for the others and not just our own interests. Um, he illustrates the, peop- the principle here, beginning in verse 25. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor, verse 24, 25. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. Um, you ever go to Chinatown in a big city? You ever go to a, a fresh meat market? Um, I've never gone to the Middle East, but I've been to a few Chinatowns. The most incredible was San Francisco when I was a little kid, and we moved out there. Um, eh, I'm not sure, you know. They're all pretty comfortable eating that duck that's been hanging in the window all day. I'd be a little reticent to take it into that duck. But um, he, what he's talking about here isn't, you know, the, the use-by date. He's talking about whether it was idle meat or not. Meat, Paul is consistent all through this. Meat is meat. And all things being equal, nothing was contaminated, certainly not spiritually contaminated, because it took a trip up to the temple and came back. And so if you don't know what it is, you're not going to die. You're not going to burn because you ate idle meat if you didn't know what it was. So if it's in the market and it's not labeled, you can eat it. Don't worry about it. So that was the first thing that he gives them. Uh, He says, eat it without asking questions for conscience sake. You don't need to know. You don't want to know. If they tell you, he's going to be very specific. If they tell you, that's different. If you don't know, he says, don't ask. Eat anything sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. God made that animal. God made that cow to pretty much any of the Jewish mind here. We're talking about cows, certainly not pork. And he says, God made that animal. And Genesis chapter 9, he he was very specific that man was to kill it and eat it. And um, it's ours. And and we can do as, as we see fit in our dominion. And so he says, but here the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Verse 27, here's another for instance. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without, in, without asking questions for conscience sake. So an unbelieving friend asks you to dinner. Don't sit down, push your plate away, and say, hey, listen, can we talk about where this came from? Don't ask. Let it be, don't ask. But if they say, oh, by the way, that's temple meat. And again, for some of them, because their world revolves around that temple, so they're thinking that may be a good thing. Hey, that meat's special. That's temple meat. If they tell you that, usually it's going to be, hey, that's temple meat. I thought you should know. I thought maybe you wouldn't be comfortable, but that's temple meat. If it's temple meat and they tell you, push the plate away. I'm sorry. My conscience won't let me do that. And my conscience, really, he's very clear about is whether or not I'm offending their conscience. The fact that they said anything points out that they have thoughts about it. Do you get what I'm saying? The fact that they mention that it's idle meat helps us know that they probably think that we'll have a problem with it because it's idle meat. That's why they brought it up. They have a conscience. Their conscience is tweaked about it in regard to us. Have you been around unsafe people? who had a higher standard for you than you had for you? I've had it happen. I've had a few times, I mean, a lot of times as a kid, I had unsafe friends that looked at me like I had two heads because I wouldn't skip church to go do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, they, they just couldn't comprehend it, and I was just the, the weirdest weirdo that they'd ever met. Uh, but there were other times where I've had people tell me what they thought my standard was, and it's crazy beyond anything that Scripture teaches and a way higher standard than would be reasonable or than what God gives us. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes, and I think that goes to Paul and eating kosher and things like that, sometimes we have to refrain from something that's absolutely not sinful by itself, but it would have an effect and it would affect my ability to minister to other people. Uh, This is the least legalistic church I've ever been part of. I'm 15 and a half years here uh, this church does not have the hang-ups that pretty much every other church I ever was part of in my life, especially the ones where I taught school or went to Christian school. They all had hang-ups about just about everything. And um, 
some of it got a little bit nuts and some of it wasn't really, it, they didn't follow through. Uh, in, in my world, my parents and my house rules for me were no movies in a movie theater. You could not go to a theater, period, dot. That was forbidden. My cousins, their dad also a preacher like my dad, their rule was absolutely no television in the house. There is no television. We will not have a television. But they were allowed to go to the movies. Let me tell you something. I know this is going to shock you. There is smut on the television. And there is good stuff at the movie theater. And the reverse is also true, isn't there? There's garbage. And now in our day and age, when we've got, you know, I mean, let's be honest, most people don't even use DVDs or Blu-rays anymore. They play a thing digitally. They're all about streaming. The world is all, you know, if I talk about DVDs and CDs, you know, they don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I showed Abby a floppy disk once. She thought it was a coaster. Uh, it's a different world, you know. Uh, but point being, uh, there's garbage in all sorts of formats. So the point isn't whether you go to the theater or not. It's not whether you allow a television in your house or not, physically. It's what do you watch in the theater. It's what do you watch on your television. But some of the Christian schools I grew up in, some of the Christian schools I taught in, that was a fireable offense. If somebody caught you coming out of a movie theater, you were done. That was it. That's how I lived. I had to sign a contract. By the way, if you sign a contract that says I'm not going to go to the movie theater, it no longer matters what your conviction is. You said you wouldn't do it, so you don't do it. So there you have it. Uh, so that's just kind of the world I came out of, and, and people would get caught on certain things like that. And Man, I know places, Christian schools, they have to make a thing objective and, and you know, so they had to say, you know, for me, the rule was my hair couldn't touch my ears and it couldn't touch my collar. And, um, you know, the young ladies, they had to, sometimes there were rulers involved with the length of skirts and all of this stuff. Boy, there were rules and there were rules everywhere. And Paul's point here is this. We have a freedom for most of that, but we've got to be careful how we use our freedom. We don't want to cause the unbeliever to stumble. We don't want to cause the young believer to stumble. We don't want to do harm to the cause of Christ. And so here, he's talking about temple meat. Again, that's never going to be an issue for you or me. But there are applications to be made throughout all of it. He says, don't ask questions. The Lord owns the earth and the meat is good. If they invite you to dinner and they put food in front of you, you don't have to ask them where it came from. But if they volunteer that this was idle meat, push it away, don't eat it. Uh, do not eat for the sake of the one who informed you, for conscience sake, conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's, for why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? But the point here is this, you don't want to cause him to sin. You know, I, I've used the illustration with you, a, a well-intentioned man uh, who lived in a very public thoroughfare offered me a non-alcoholic beer once. Would I have been sinning Drinking that beer out on a busy street, not by itself, but from across the street, people wouldn't have necessarily known what it was. And people seeing the preacher with the beer in his hand, that would give a license, and it would tend to spiral out of that a little bit. There's a little bit of a domino effect. So I had to let it go and beg off and get my Diet Coke. Uh, but here, uh, the person who tells you about it, for their conscience sake, let it go by. Verse 30, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? By the way, if you can sit down, bow your head, and pray and thank God for a thing that you're participating in or enjoying, it's a pretty good, pretty good thought it's not sinful. If you can, with any kind of a straight face and good conscience, bow your head and say, Lord, thanks for this. Thanks for this. That's really a pretty good measurement uh, when it all comes down to it. And so... They've shared their convictions, they've said something, don't do it. And if I cause another to violate his conscience, this goes back to chapter 8, I cause them to sin. And if I cause someone else to sin, that's me sinning as well. Uh, and then the command here, verses 31 and following, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, whether you drink, we, this is again, this is a wall hanging verse that we see outside its context all the time. It's a famous verse. In this context, he's talking about temple meat and so forth. And he says, whether you eat or drink, wh whatever you're doing, do all to the glory of God. Is God glorified? Let me really, really make that statement simple. To glorify God. The word glory means brightness. 
It could be brightness of countenance, uh, the glory of God when Moses saw him, when he was hidden in the cleft of the rock and he just saw God's back as he passed by. Remember that Moses glowed for like three weeks after that. Moses came down from the hill, came down off the mount, off Sinai, and he had some of God's glory left over on him and he was shining by it. We'd say he looked radioactive is probably how we'd describe it today. Uh, we, we think the nuclear reactor had a leak or something. Uh, but the glory of God has to do with brightness of, of appearance. But really for us to glorify God is to make God look good. To make God look good. Parents, when your boy holds the door for somebody, helps them carry a heavy, a heavy thing, says yes ma'am and no sir, is polite, says thank you, washes their hands before dinner. Does any of those little things we try to teach them, when they do that, how do you feel? Yeah, that's nice. When they don't do that, what do we do? We look at our spouse and say, he's your kid. <laughs> right? We pass the buck. That's what we do. Uh, but, you know, sometimes when you watch them do a good thing, you know, you see it. You realize others see it. And, and I've had some young men that I taught. There was one uh, dad that he raised seven kids. And uh, his boys were just impressive to me. I taught them. I coached them. They were fine young men. And I told him as the father of two little boys at the time, I said, anytime you want to talk about being a dad, I'm all ears. You talk, I'll listen. Why? Because he did it well. How did I know he did it well? I saw his boys day in and day out consistently doing the right thing. And I was impressed by it. They were making their mom and dad look good. As believers, we're supposed to make our God look good and never the opposite. I, I've seen it where youth groups, one time it was, it was a youth group I was part of. Uh, my youth group when I was a teenager was pretty horrible. And we were you know, stopped to eat at a fast food restaurant on the way back uh, to camp or back from camp, something like that. And the guys, some of the guys were carrying on so much that our youth group got kicked out. That's a horrible thing. What a terrible testimony. What a terrible way to hurt the cause of Christ. I've had other times where I've been part of a youth group that's done a good thing and glorified the Lord, and it makes the church look good, it makes the parents look good, and its whole purpose is to make our Heavenly Father look good. We need to glorify God. Whether we eat, drink, whatever we do, are we helping the cause of Christ? I put there in your notes, I call on you to think of it this way. Um, do I have God's name, God's best, and God's desire in my mind? God's name, that is his reputation. Am I making him look bad by what I do? Uh, the summer after my freshman year of college, I worked for a scoundrel of an unsaved man. He was just, he was the kind of guy that you just, you just, you spent a little time with him and you wanted to go take a hot shower with a lot of soap. He, he was just slimy and he was just, steeped in sin, everything about him. But you know, Jimmy Swaggart, the TV preacher, fell into sin that summer. And that is all I heard every day. You're going to college so you can be just like Jimmy Swaggart. You're just like Jimmy Swaggart. You're just like Jimmy Swaggart. That's all I heard. Why? Because he wanted something that made him feel better about himself. And Swaggart's fall into sexual sin put a stain on the rest of us. We didn't ask for, we didn't participate in it, but it stained everybody that claimed Christ for a while. What a heartbreaking thing. Um, do we make God look good? Do we glorify Him by what we do? Do we want God's best? God's best for us and God's best for others. We talked about contentment and complacency. Complacency being satisfied with less than God's best. We want God's best. We don't want to be satisfied, as we said last week, with just enough Christianity. We need to be very careful of that just enough mindset that we fall into too well. And again, it's not my desires or those of others, but it's God's glory that should dictate my actions. How do I make God look? Does it hurt the cause of Christ? Does it help the cause of Christ? Uh, he says, verse 32, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Don't cause the immature to stumble. An offense is, in the way Paul uses it, is causing someone else to fall into sin, causing them to stumble. Don't do that with, with other believers or with people that haven't trusted God as yet, etc. Don't cause the immature to stumble. And don't keep the unsaved from the Savior. I was very clear with you. I told the story just recently of Wendy from Wendy's and the fact that 
the day that I finally tried to share Christ with her as a high school kid, she looked at me, basically told me I was a punk and I was as bad as all the other unsaved kids around me. And I had no, you know, Paul, the, or Christ says, if the, you're the salt of the earth, if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's not good for anything but pavement and traction. It's lost its savor. That was me at that time. Uh, I lost my ability to do anything for God because my actions, my words, were stinking it up. Don't cause the immature to stumble. Don't keep the unsaved from the Savior. And don't bring harm to the cause of Christ. I have to be very honest with you again. This is, you know, uh, the confessions of a former Christian teenager, a second generation Christian. There were times in my life where my decision to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing had more to do with pleasing my heavenly father and not hurting his ministry than it did with pleasing my, or pleasing my earthly father and his ministry than it did with not displeasing my heavenly father. Do you understand what I said even though I tripped all over it? I tried to make my dad happy and not hurt his ministry. And so I was doing the right thing for the wrong reason, and I was avoiding the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And as time goes by, you realize it's really me and God. And am I helping or am I hurting? So what of it? This isn't about idle meat, but this is about me using my freedoms in Christ. Uh, this is about how I live my daily life in front of other people. Do your neighbors know you're saved? I don't mean do they know you go to church. I know a whole lot of people that go to church that have no relation with Jesus Christ at all. Don't know him. But they go to church very faithfully. I mean, my dad's family back in PA, so many of my dad's family were in church four or five times a week but never knew Christ because Christ wasn't in their church. It's a heartbreaking thing. Do they know what Christ means to you? Do they know about your faith in Jesus Christ and that your eternal salvation is in only this, Jesus, the Son of God, died for me and rose again, do they know that about you? Can they tell it in their actions? If, they, if you're not sure, ask it this way. If somebody told them that you were a born-again Christian, would they be surprised? Would there, if you were, it's been well said, if you were on trial for being a born-again Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? It's another way to look at it. Do they see Jesus in you? Do they know that about you? If they don't know that about you, there's really two reasons, isn't there? One is I'm not living the right way. I'm not living to please the Lord. I'm not checking my freedoms at the door when I need to check my freedoms at the door. And therefore, because of the sin in my life, they don't see Jesus in me. And, and the other is that I'm just being straight up selfish and I haven't talked to them about it. I've kept quiet. Sometimes the two go together. They've seen me on a bad day. You know, they've seen me kick the can down the driveway. They've heard me cuss and swear at that can as it flips down the driveway. I can't talk to them about Jesus. Well, again, the challenge there is this, get control of ourselves so that we don't get in our own way and that we can share the word of God with people and we can share the saving testimony of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world. Uh, may we try to not do what's expedient, or only because it's ex expedient, but because it pleases the Lord, because it will help to win the lost and it will build up other believers. Father, thank you for your word. Impress it on our hearts. Help us, Lord, to make good choices. Help us to feed the good things and to starve out the sin in our life. We realize, Lord, we have in Christ, we have a, a new person, but the old man's still there as well. And, uh, Lord, they fight inside us all the time. Which one are we feeding? Uh, Lord, we really need to realize that what we put in is what we get out. Help us, Lord, to feast on your word, to be with your people, and to be before you in prayer. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in whatever we do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, may it be our prayer, only one life to offer, Jesus my Lord and King, let's stand together as we sing.
for thine own to be used by Savior. 